thank you very much, Toby, for agreeing to give a Build a Soul seminar. And you can get started. All right. Let me share my screen. All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this planet. Thank you so much for hosting me for a Build a Synthetic Cell seminar. I'm quite excited. And I'm not sure what I can tell you about building a synthetic cell. Uh, I think we haven't achieved it yet, and we are far away from achieving that. Uh, I'm just one of the PIs trying to at least achieve a little bit of uh, on the way, right? So, um, and I'm currently at the Max Planck Society. It's a fantastic place to work at because it allows us to do basic research uh, almost without any limitations. Uh, it's really a great opportunity for us and for my team and me really to uh, to really uh, do science uh, in the broadest sense and with a big vision. And uh, yeah, that's basically my two cents about the Max Planck Society, about fundamental research. Uh, of course, we have a big aim. Uh, we we envision to reinvent photosynthesis. Um, but uh, beyond uh, beyond this big aim, there's a lot of things, I think, of fundamental research we still have to achieve. Uh, and I think in the next hopefully 30 minutes, you'll get a sense of uh, what we are trying uh, to do here in our lab in Marburg, which is close to Frankfurt. So if you ever fly by Frankfurt Airport, you stop by and can say hi. It's approximately an hour and uh, 20 minutes if Deutsche Bahn doesn't run late, which unfortunately does it quite often these days. So German accuracy and engineering has a hard time, at least in terms of, uh, of the infrastructure. All right, let's get started. I called my talk Building Complexity Out of Thin Air because this is what it is. We actually try to build complex molecules, uh, complex functionalities, starting with a very simple molecule. In fact, the simplest molecule you can think of, which is carbon dioxide. And so the idea, as I already mentioned, really is for us to, uh, to think and rethink the way how nature does it how nature deals with CO2, and then eventually copying, improving, and uh, making CO2 fixation better than nature does it currently. Now, of course, you can ask, why are we interested in CO2? Well, uh, it's very simple. Uh, and uh, the answer basically lies in the air surrounding us. It's all about this small molecule, carbon dioxide, which is an important greenhouse gas. And uh, I think we all know that since for the last, let's say, decades, even centuries, since the onset of industrialization, we have been accumulating this molecule in the atmosphere. And uh, if you think and think about cool global budgets currently, global current CO2 budgets, uh, it's around about nine gigatons carbon or 40 gigatons CO2 that we yearly emit as a, as a, as a society on this planet, as, as, as humans on this planet. And we all know this is severe consequences. Uh, I think I don't need to tell you that uh, CO2 is important greenhouse gas. And I think I don't need to tell you that, of course, uh, the increase of CO2 is directly correlated to the effects of climate change and global warming we are seeing here. And that's typically something people look at and say, wow, that's a challenge for us uh, as a society, as a planet. And uh, I think one of the goals would be to uh, find ways how to filter out this molecule back from the atmosphere and make something useful out of it. And of course, that's something we should be doing as scientists, as a society. However, it's pretty hard to imagine how to do this on a global scale and what kind of technologies you could basically think of. And um, despite many efforts, I think, uh, chemically speaking, there is no single process, no single catalyst, no single physical chemical uh, process where you can actually filter out CO2 from the atmosphere and convert it into multi-carbon compound that we can use in our everyday life. And in principle, these chemical efforts are still outcompeted largely by biology, which has already found a way how to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. And uh, most of you will know what I'm talking about. It's, uh, it's uh, biological CO2 fixation. It's mainly photosynthesis. That is a process that allows you to capture approximately 100 gigatons carbon per year, 400 gigatons CO2 per year, simply with light. And it's a fantastic solution. Yet, however, it is not perfect from many different points of view. And it's actually not perfect uh, from uh, the product you make. So if I talk about biomass, I'm, we are talking about a very complex mixture of uh, different chemical compounds. They are basically something pretty hard to, uh, to use in, every, in, in our everyday chemical industry. So it's uh, sugars, it's basically lignin, and this is not easy to functionalize and to play around with. So the product of CO2 fixation is hard to deal with, 
at least in, 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 in chemical terms. And second, and more importantly, the actual enzymes and pathway involved in CO2 fixation are also not perfect. And this becomes obvious if you look at the most important process of biological CO2 fixation, which is the so-called Calvin benson bessem cycle or the dark reaction in photosynthesis. This is basically done by one single enzyme, uh, the C2 capture in uh, the Calvin cycle. This enzyme is called Rubisco or ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. And it's interesting to note that this enzyme is basically the bottleneck of C2 capture and conversion. Uh, if everything else is correct, so if the plant has enough nutrients, if it has enough water, Rubisco and light, Rubisco becomes the bottlenecking enzyme. Why is that? Well, it's because Rubisco is a very slow catalyst. An average Rubisco takes approximately 5 to 10 C2 molecules per second, which is pretty slow compared to other enzymes we all know in central carbon metabolism. You have sometimes turnover frequencies of 10,000, 100,000 molecules per second. Rubisco, though, is very slow, and it's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that Rubisco actually also is very sloppy. What I mean with that is Rubisco fixes carbon dioxide. At the same time, it also fixes oxygen. And in fact, it mixes up oxygen and CO2 at the active site and has an error rate of approximately 20%, which means that every fifth time, instead of fixing a CO2 molecule, Rubisco would fix an oxygen molecule. This would be a process called photorespiration. And this process wastes a lot of energy. And more importantly, it releases previously fixed carbon dioxide. So what I'm telling you is the enzyme itself, once it fixes oxygen, creates a bigger problem uh, and, uh, and is, is really making and causing a lot of trouble to the plant. Now, that's a starting point of rethinking photosynthesis. And the obvious first question would be, can we not simply improve the enzyme? engineering, bioengineering, to make the enzyme faster. And yes, you can make Rubisco faster, but then you sacrifice specificity, and the enzyme becomes even worse in fixing, uh, in fixing uh, CO2 and oxygen. The specificity goes down. You could also ask, can you make the enzyme more specific? And yes, you can do that. So you can make the enzyme more specific, that it preferentially eats up and takes up CO2 instead of oxygen. But then the catalytic rate slows down. And it's pretty much a Pareto optimum the enzyme has evolved. So if you touch one parameter speed, you automatically sacrifice the other parameter specificity. It's with us human beings, if you write emails very quickly on our mobile phone or you text a message, if you're fast, you're sloppy. And if you're trying to be more accurate, you'd automatically slow down in writing your, 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 your text message. So in other words, there's a, other words, there's a biophysical, biochemical limitation in Rubisco. And this has been really starting a starting point for our own endeavor in our lab, where we thought if we cannot improve the central enzyme of photosynthesis, if we cannot improve Rubisco and likely also not the Calvin Benson Besson cycle, why don't we think about other pathways, other solutions that are based on other chemistries that we could think of and build and realize in the lab? And this is something we call synthetic CO2 fixation. At the same time, of course, converting inorganic matter into organic matter is something that we anyway need to touch if we talk about artificial life, life from basically uh, starting from non-living material. Well, of course, you could ask, is it actually possible? Can you reinvent the operating system of the global carbon cycle, if you want to say so? Is it actually possible to find new solutions for the capture and conversion of inorganic carbon organic matter? And you might want to be hum humble and take a lesson from nature and look at what that nature can offer. What I show you here is the solution space of biological CO2 fixation. What I show you here is enzymes. Uh, basically, these are the abbreviations here, GCC, FCR, Rubisco. And you see the nodes which connect and build the metabolic network and the metabolic pathway. And you see here that plants have evolved basically two ways to fix carbon, or one way, the calvin benson besson cycle. And there is a boosting system called the C4 or CAM pathway. What you also see is microbes have invented six other pathways for CO2 fixation. And so it's interesting that during evolution, nature apparently explored multiple options. And as a biologist, I'm very excited and very uh, <laughs> flattered or kind of uh, looking at those different solutions that nature has explored during evolution. So the landscape is actually very exciting for me as a biologist and amazed by this biological diversity. Well, if I look at the same landscape as a synthetic biologist, I actually see a lot of void space and I see a lot of solutions 
that nature is apparently not explored. And this is just flipping in those different solutions. We could think of different pathways, different enzymes that would also allow us to fix carbon dioxide. And this is exactly what we try to do in our lab. We try to build those solutions that nature has not explored to populate the landscape and to test which of these solutions we can actually realize and which of these solutions we can use in the context of a cell, be it natural or artificial. And I want to make a small distinction between metabolic engineering and synthetic biology. So typically, metabolic engineering takes existing solution and tries to improve it, whereas synthetic biology really for us is to build a new to nature solution that we have not seen existing in any biological system yet. And this is exactly what we are striving for. Or to give a different example, um, think about how we ended up at building an airplane. We actually took inspiration from nature. We looked at birds. We understood bird flight, the principles of Auftrieb, as you say in German. But the actual plane we built at the end of the day did not flap its wings or has feathers. It looks very different, but used the same physical chemical or physical principles uh, to fly. And that's exactly what we want to try to do when we build synthetic CO2 fixation. We actually want to understand how metabolism, how CO2 fixation is energized and performed at the level of the cell or of the chloroplast in photosynthesis. And we want to take this knowledge to build a solution. This could be, for instance, here an artificial chloroplast, a human solution built by human beings that mimics the same principles, but might look very differently. And how we're going to do this is a, in a very straightforward workflow matter. So we want to first design new to nature synthetic pathways, find a really efficient CO2 fixation metabolic network. We want to go ahead, find the individual parts, which means the enzymes and proteins to build the actual system. We could call it the molecular system. We could call it the metabolic software. Uh, we try to optimize the system and the parts in, um, in, in, in different rounds. And once we have a stable uh, metabolic software or operating system, we try to implement it inside of a cellular context, a cellular hardware, if you want to say so. And this could be natural or an artificial cell. I'm talking about the artificial cell, maybe or an artificial cell-like context in a couple of minutes. And of course, a big goal would be then after prototyping uh, to even move forward uh, in terms of living systems to also move some of the metabolic solutions inside of a real world organism like a plant. All right, so let's get quickly started. How do we sign the synthetic CO2 fixation cycles where we take a process uh, that uh, you probably know if you're a chemist uh, and familiar with chemistry. Is called metabolic retrosynthesis. It's basically thinking about potential hypothetical theoretical conversions of metabolites and fixation of CO2. And what you see here is a couple of these solutions. Uh, for instance, a catch cycle we have published around about seven years ago, the HOPEC cycle we just published this year. So a couple of different solutions that all look very differently in terms of their chemistry. And what I mean here is the different metabolites, they have different transformations. And so they're all different in terms of the topologies. At the same time, all these different solutions also have some common principles. And one common principle is that all of these pathways, at least those shown here, are cycles, which means that the product of a CO2 fixation step shown in red uh, is turned around to become again the substrate for a CO2 fixation step. Or in other words, you can go in round and round and round cycles to continuously fix CO2. And that's the principle of a metabolic cycle. So it's the first principle, a cycle, a cyclic process. The second common principle is that you have a valve reaction, a reaction where you can split off some of the fixed carbon and you can take it out of the cycle to make a multi-carbon compound molecule. For instance, pyruvate, it could be malate, it could be clyoxalate, a small carboxylic acid, for instance, in terms of the catch cycle. And this would allow you to build the biomass or to build a product or to feed a synthetic cell. And you basically have converted CO2 in a continuous fashion into a simple building block. Well, these are different solutions I show you. And at some point, you need to decide which of these solutions is actually a good one. You need to have evaluation principles, principles to look at those different solutions. And what we use are very simple physical chemical criteria. And we ask, first of all, which of the cycles we have thought of would be a very fast and efficient cycle? In other words, which chemistries would allow us to have high turnover rates? 
And one example is shown here, the catch cycle we've built again, like in 2016. This is based on highly efficient fast enzyme reactions and conversion, at least theoretically. And most importantly, I want to point out the central step, the C2 fixation step, that is not based on Rubisco, which is very slow, as I said before. It is based on another principle called ECRs, NOE-CoA carboxylase reductases, which have K-cats or turnover frequencies that are around about 10 to maybe 20% faster and a percent, uh, 10 to 20 times faster than Rubisco. So we're talking about CO2 fixation, 100 CO2 molecules per second. So in principle, the central step in the catch cycle should be 10 to 20 times faster than what happens in natural photosynthesis. So kinetics matter for us when we design the cycles or decide which cycle to build. And the second principle we're really keen on is thermodynamics. In other words, the energy we have to invest to capture and convert CO2 into the multi-carbon products. What I mean with that, well, basically we talk about the ATP we have to invest or ultimately the photons we have to invest to produce and to capture the carbon dioxide. So for the catch cycle, we actually need only half of the ATP that natural photosynthesis would be using. We can basically minimize the energetic waste, if you want to say so. And again, this adds to the efficiency of the system. So the catch cycle in principle, like also the HOPEC cycle, by the way, should be faster and use less ATP to natural photosynthesis. And this made it a great example to build firsthand. While we went ahead and we will make a long story short, we basically went back to the wet lab and we identified for each individual step that we had thought of an enzyme that we used to build the first version of the cycle. Well, it looks simple on the paper, uh, but in fact, this slide has taken us probably one or two years to find for each individual step, a good catalyst, a good protein, a good homolog, which we could use to build a first version of the catch cycle. And in total, we used 15 different enzymes. We tested approximately 60 to 70 enzymes and enzyme variants to build the first version of the catch cycle. These organisms, uh, these enzymes are from very different organisms. You could think of like uh, from different bacteria, archaea, even an enzyme from the human liver. And we actually had also to engineer one enzyme to build and to construct and close the cycle. But we could actually really show that once we had all the 15 enzymes together, we put everything into one Eppendorf, we add the green compound called propionyl-CoA, then we basically added chemical energy, ATP and ATPH, and the system started to capture CO2 and convert CO2 into malate. And this was really a breakthrough for us at that time because it told us you can really think of a new metabolic system, you can go back to the lab, you can build and realize it, and it's actually functional. We were pretty excited about that because I think it's the first human-made uh, uh, CO2 fixation pathway. It adds to the seven natural solutions. But we also got a little bit disappointed when we realized how bad the system actually performed. What you see here is the CO2 molecules per acceptor per minute or hour actually the system was fixing. So in other words, we had built a system, a system that was fixing CO2, but it was very, very slow. And in other words, if you look at this picture here, it put a foot into a base camp. We had basically established a first version of the cycle, but we were far from reaching the optimum. And the next couple of years, we actually had to spend quite some time to optimize the system for different rounds of evolution, version two, version three, version 3.1, 3.4, and so on and so forth. So what happened actually was that we had built a system, but the system was not perfectly operating. And the problem was that we had really thought about each individual step to optimize each conversion, but we had not factored in to optimize the network. So we actually had a lot of enzymes that were promiscuous and took other substrates or got inhibited by substrates. Uh, we had fall off reactions. We basically had a big mess. And we, again, as I said, building metabolic complexity does not mean to take the best parts but to build the most robust and most best functioning system. And I think it's a system optimization or the part optimization. And to really kind of achieve that, we spend a lot of time in deep bottlenecking the metabolic network. So we thought about the problematic enzymes that did side reactions, try to improve their specificity, try to suppress side reactions to enzyme redesign, enzyme engineering. We actually try to kind of uh, circumvent certain problematic reactions and going a different chemical route, the same metabolites, but a different chemistry to go from A to B. And we even added enzymes 
that remove metabolic waste or drop off reactions. So we added actually more enzymes to the cycle that made the enzyme or the system more robust and it scavenged toxic metabolites. And so all together has helped us to really improve the catch cycle by a factor of 20. And we ended up now with 17 different enzymes from nine different organisms and three engineered enzymes and actually a rate of CO2 fixation is comparable to biological systems if you break up uh, the cells and try to measure CO2 fixation in vitro in the reaction tube. Now, this has been fantastic, but it had also been a lot of work for us. I would say it has been probably uh, round about um, another two to three years to achieve this factor of 20, playing evolution to carefully analyzing what's going wrong and trying to de-bottleneck uh, in, in, in a rationally informed manner. But of course, that's very tedious and sometimes you cannot disentangle and understand exactly all the different combinations and the different interactions of this complex network. And so we thought of other ways to improve the system and uh, to maybe move forward and use other ways to systematically explore the or a optimum. And for that, we actually uh, started uh, to use a combination of automation, miniaturization, and combinatorial piping together of the different components. And then a uh, high throughput, or may might call it high throughput, it's more like a medium throughput analysis of the different combinations. And then feeding back uh, all the data into an active learning uh, algorithm. And this predicts the next number of combinations. And so what we really did is we miniaturized the catch cycle uh, we basically automized it with a contact-free piping robot, and this allowed us to prototype in a 10 microliters uh, scale in 384 wells, a uh, different combination of enzyme and cofactors, pHs, um, and, and different buffer systems uh, in a random fashion, get the data, and then do this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, learning, uh, learning algorithms. And what it really allowed us to do is to conquer, explore a space that we define as approximately 10 to the power of 25. So we had 17 enzymes, four different cofactors, four different substrates we played around with, and seven buffers. And we set up this kind of more complex screen. We went with around about 3,000 experiments, uh, which is around about 100,000 pivoting steps. And we kind of narrowed down between exploring and optimization, playing a little bit around with the active learning algorithm. And this allowed us really to move forward by a factor of 10 within eight rounds of optimization here shown on the right side. And each individual dot is a triplicate. And uh, you see uh, the efficiency in certain cases uh, in, increased by a factor of, uh, of 10. These are the purple, purple circles here. These were really excellent and, and, and really great combinations that we kind of identified with this active learning algorithm. I'm not saying this is the optimum because you of course explore a certain, it's pretty hard to jump from a viable solution to another viable solution, but it's a optimum. And again, it took us considerably less time in an automized fashion to, to, uh, to improve the system by another factor of 10. And as a matter of fact, we have used this now in two other pathways. We have recently built the HOPEX cycle and the theta cycle uh, uh, where we now routinely in a way, use this kind of build, test, learn, design cycle to improve this in vitro pathways in, in a more in a more automated fashion. All right. So where are we standing right now? Um, if I compare ourselves, the catch cycle to what chemistry can do. Well, what we do in the catch cycle is basically fixing carbon dioxide in 17 different reactions into a small C2 compound called glyoxylate. And what really this is about is that we have 17 different reactions that can work in parallel. It's a complex metabolic network, if you want to say so. And this is much more than we have achieved these days in chemistry, where you can actually operate one to two, maybe three reactions in parallel before we have to change the buffer system or have to change the conditions, the catalytic conditions. So as a matter of fact, with these more complex catalytic cascades, we already have achieved a factor of 10 compared to classical chemistry. But of course, we are still far away from what biology can do. If you think about a cell, this is a thousand different reactions you can run in parallel. So these metabolic networks are even crazier and there is much more built into it. And one thing we've been asking ourselves is, can we now really extend the catch cycle? Can we extend uh, the metabolic 
and catalytic capabilities of such a system? Could we think, for instance, about building more complex molecules, let's say polyketides, that could be antibiotics, fungicides, or anti-cancer drugs, high-value compounds directly from CO2, starting off, for instance, from glyoxylate. And uh, we actually have taken on this challenge, and we thought about doing that. And one example we've chosen is basically the molecule shown down here, which is called 6-DEP, or 6 deoxy threonylate B, which is the core of erythromycin, a very important antibiotic. And the cool thing is that the catch cycle features metabolites that you need if you want to build this molecule. And so a very simple approach for us had been to run the catch cycle of fixed CO2, and then to use uh, basically downstream reactions uh, and catalytic steps to convert the metabolites into, uh, into uh, this compound here shown uh, called 6-DEP. The problem though is that it didn't work. It did not work. We could not actually fix CO2 and build the molecule. And why is that so? Well, the principle of a cycle is that you continuously cycle molecules and you cannot simply take out the core metabolites without breaking the system, right? And of course, on the opposite, if you keep the system turning, uh, you cannot build the molecule. So in other words, we basically led to the fact that we neither fixed CO2 nor we built the molecule because the two systems are interdependent on each other. What we had to think of is of ways how to refit the cycle, how to refill the cycle autocatalytically so that we can take off substrates that we can use to build the molecule. And this is in chemistry or in biology known as anaplerosis. So anaplerotic strategies are reactions that refill the cycle. To make a long story short, what we came up with is actually anaplerotic modules that would allow us to actually convert the CO2 fixation products back into molecules of the cycle we then could take off. And what we show here is work, fantastic work by, in this case, Chris and, um, and Patrick, who actually signed many different anaplotic reaction modules, tested those, and what they identified is basically one condition, one module, the 3 hydroxypropionate module, which actually worked quite well. And we further optimized uh, the system. We could actually show that if you now implement this anaplerotic, this kind of anaplerotic feedback in this metabolic network, you can actually really achieve six step production directly from CO2. And now we are talking about 50 plus reaction we have that we can coordinate in time and space to directly convert carbon dioxide inorganic molecule into a complex, uh, complex chemical molecule. All right. Now I talked about complex molecules. Uh, another small thing I want to quickly mention is molecular complexity. So if you really think about the chloroplast and if you think about how photosynthesis is organized, it's not just a bag of enzymes. It's not just uh, it's not just thrown together and here you go. It's actually highly organized in time and space. And I hope you appreciate really the complex structure of such a beautiful structure of, of a chloroplast where you have elements that use light as energy source to produce NADPH and ATP. And you have elements where CO2 fixation happens, coordinated really uh, in, 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 in a three-dimensional structure. And you have then starch being built also. In, so it's really a, in, in time and space organized, uh, organized complex molecular machine. And the one question we ask ourselves is, can we try to mimic at least and control also CO2 fixation in time and space instead of a soup of enzymes that we have in the Eppendorf cup. Well, how can we do this? Well, first question was, can we actually power and use light to power the catch cycle? Can we basically bring together this synthetic cycle we have thought of and built in the lab? And can we bring it together with photosynthetic membranes that would power and provide ATP and NADPH? And so first step, really simple isolate thylakoid membranes, photosynthetic membranes from spinach, put it together with the catch cycle and surprise, the system did not work. So we did not see any CO2 fixation. We had to optimize the system to swap two enzymes, uh, take, other, uh, take uh, other routes, and lo and behold, then we were actually able to really run the catch cycle together with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the natural photosynthetic machinery. This was the first part, so energizing a system with light. The second part has been to now provide an envelope or a cellular mimic or compartment 
we actually can encapsulate, uh, we can basically encapsulate uh, the enzymes together with the photosynthetic membranes. And for that, we had a fantastic collaboration with uh, Jean-Christophe Barry in Bordeaux and Taryn was uh, the person who took this project uh, to Bordeaux and worked uh, in both labs here in Marburg and uh, in France. And she really managed uh, to encapsulate in micro droplets, cell sized droplets with microfluidics, the catch cycle enzymes as well as, uh, as the photosynthetic membranes. This is how the system looks like the artificial chloroplast, uh, the mimic, if you call it. You see the photosynthetic membranes where you have the light to energy conversion. And then there's the catch cycle enzymes floating freely in, in the system here. And you can actually see this here. I hope the video actually works. Uh, you can actually see how you can power up the system. That's the blue color. You produce NADPH, which is autofluorescent. And you see if you turn on the light, the photosynthetic membranes make the NADPH. If you turn off the lights, it's completely consumed. You decharge the batteries, if you want to say so, the, the compartments, they fix CO2. You can recharge them again, and you can basically have different cycles of light. And the system really is, is operating, fixing CO2 for about 90 minutes to two hours. And it really fixes carbon dioxide uh, a little bit even more efficiently than in bulk solution. And so we really achieved to build a system we can control in time and space in a confined, in a confined space and compartment. Now, what I've shown you is not really a synthetic cell and it's really also not a high, it's more like a hybrid. It's something in between natural and synthetic. It still relies on enzymes. It still relies on photosynthetic membranes. We isolate from the spinach. Uh, but we have already elements in there that we bring in uh, that are non-natural, like these uh, water and oil droplets, these microfluidics droplets, right? That's an interface of natural synthetic biological world, but you could think even more synthetic. You could think, for instance, of, let's say, bioelectricity. So can we, for instance, instead of using light, directly feed in electricity to run CO2 fixation? Is this possible? Uh, you know, it's again like going more towards photovoltaics, renewable sustainable energy, but then still having biocatalysis powered from a different uh, from a different energy source. And it's something we have been also playing around uh, very recently. And uh, one of the things we became interested in is the question, can we power the central CO2 fixation step of the catch cycle with electricity? And uh, for that, it's important to note that CO2 fixation, the catch cycle, is basically based on a reductive carboxylation. So you have a compound called crotonyl-CoA shown here and a compound called agri-CoA shown down here. And those systems fix carbon dioxide or these enzymes fix carbon dioxide into these molecules and they reduce at the same time the molecules. And of course, reducing equivalence and they're reducing equivalent it's used in, in, in these catalytic systems, NADPH. But you can think of creating NADPH from free electrons that you generate from electrodes. So what we thought of and collaborated with is a, is a team here also in Germany, where you basically had electrodes that provide electrons into a hydrogel. These hydrogel electrons can actually be handed over to an enzyme called FNR, which is immobilized. This enzyme picks up individual electrons regenerates NADPH from NADP plus, and this NADPH can be used to fix carbon dioxide. So it's really an embedded electrode that can provide NADPH and we can actually fix CO2 directly uh, with very high efficiency and yields up to 90% conversion we achieve with the central CO2 fixation step, which tells you it is really possible to use electricity to drive uh, the core steps of the catch cycle. Well, NADPH is one important thing that we can generate. And in fact, other labs have already demonstrated NADPH or NADH conversion through electricity. But another important biomolecule that you need to energize biological systems, complex metabolic networks is of course ATP. And ATP is a bit more tricky because ATP requires the generation of an energy rich phosphate bond. And it's nothing you can directly do with electricity typically. And in fact, if you think about how nature generates or regenerates ATP, it basically takes a reduced equivalent, it oxidizes it to a very complex membrane-bound biochemical process until the electrons go on a finite electron acceptor and you pump protons across a membrane, you do charge separation, 
And then you have the ATPase, which basically then uh, makes the ATP through a, uh, to kind of using up uh, this electro proton multiforce gradient. And so Shanshan uh, Luo in our lab was actually brave enough to think about ways how to use electricity to build ATP. And she had basically uh, three or four different uh, uh, kind of goals in mind when she tried to think about the synthetic biological solution. She first thought of a membrane free system. So don't use any membranes if possible, because this is just too complex to build in the lab. And I think many of you that work on membranes know exactly how complicated it is to rebuild a respiratory chain or such a complex chain of events. The second, uh, the second goal she had was basically to have a minimal set of components to use because the, uh, the, the easier, the more less complex the system, the more robust and likely is that you can build it, right? Then we wanted to actually build a system that we can also use to hook it up to downstream molecules and downstream reactions. Let's say the system should be compatible with in vitro biocatalysis and biosteps. And of course, the energetic efficiency should also be viable at the end of the day. Now, this is what Shanshan at the end of the day came up. It's very exciting. What she found was actually an enzyme that is able to directly reduce carboxylic acids into aldehydes. It can use acetate and produce acid aldehyde can use propionate and make propion aldehyde. And it can do so by using low potential electrons. So electrons that are on the level of, let's say, minus 0.6, minus 0.9 volt can be used to actually reduce a free carboxylic acid into an aldehyde. And then she thought about actually closing the cycle and re-oxidizing the aldehyde back into a free acid. So to create a continuous cycle in which you can power the reduction of propionate to the aldehyde with low potential electrons. And then you can oxidize the propion aldehyde back to the propionate, produce NADPH, and notably kind of regenerate ATP. Lo and behold, you could actually show that the system works if you add, for instance, uh, low electrons with titanium-3. But you could also show that you actually can use electrons from an electrode uh, through ferrocenium as a mediator. And you can actually really build this cycle and the cycle is able to pick up free electrons to make ATP. And this ATP can use, for instance, to activate glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. So you can really run a biochemical reaction, ATP-dependent biochemical reaction, with this uh, electricity setup. And she went even a step further. It was fantastic collaboration work with actually a couple of people in our lab. We could show that you can actually also use the ATP for in vitro transcription translation. So you can basically set up a complex in vitro transcription translation system and swap out the ATP by ADP. And you can power ATP formation with electricity. So you can make the RNA or the mRNA. And then you make also ATP that you can use to do the protein translation. And so what you actually show together with other people in the lab is that you really can produce a fluorescent protein directly from electricity as energy source. I think that's really fantastic for us to see that such complex techno-biological hybrids are really possible. For sure, it's not perfect. And for sure, the equilibrium is not playing into our favor. But we have at least a first proof of concept we can work with in the future. Now, lastly, I want to quickly move to another ongoing project in the lab. And this is done by Simone, who actually asked himself, now we have built all these complex metabolic networks. Everything is fine and super fantastic. But we still need also to factor in reaction decision-making. Networks contain information, and information means that we can react to things we build with these networks. And so what he really became interested in is asking, is asking himself, can we actually connect metabolic activity and genetic readouts? In other words, can we actually use the catch cycle to produce elements that then would lead and give us the opportunity to do in vitro transcription translation. And what he actually figured and thought of is that the output molecule of the initial catch cycle is glyoxylate. If you take glyoxylate and you further convert it into a, an aminated, you convert it into glycine, which is an essential amino acid. And then he thought about using a pure system, which basically is relying on amino acids and just take off 
glycine. So it's a pure system without any glycine. So you don't have any readout because you lack an essential element of, trans uh, of translation. Unless, of course, unless the catch cycle is operating, fixing CO2, and you have an enzyme that does the glycine glycine conversion, then you make glycine, and then you actually can operate the genetic network of the pure system in vitro. And this is exactly what you see here. So if he adds, uh, if he adds uh, this GGT1, which is the amino transferase, and he actually starts the catch cycle. You see that only then you produce, uh, you produce, uh, you produce the readout uh, and you produce a, uh, the uh, fluorescence uh, protein. Now that's cool. You can think even crazier. You can, for instance, make the catch cycle limiting and take away enzymes it needs, and you can let the catch cycle simply run, and you have an autocratic mode that let, can let it produce its own amino transferase to propel and autocratically improve activity of the cycle. And that's something is also built, a feedback, positive feedback loop. And I think that's really one of the first steps where you really can show that metabolic networks can start to coordinate and be coordinated with, uh, with genetic networks. And uh, I think that's really a step forward for us in terms of really building systems, metabolic networks that can be, uh, that can also make decisions at some point in time. Okay. All right, so that's it. Um, yeah, I think what I want to also mention here is that everything we're trying to do in my work uh, is basic research still. Uh, I've talked about new to nature pathways, decision-making, droplets, artificial globalists, but you know everything we have been built is still very fragile. It's, uh, it's still far from being perfect and robust. It's still far from being a, a perfect cell, perfect system that we can use at a large scale. But I think what we, really aiming for is understanding how to build such complex systems, how to coordinate them in time and space, and how to build more, more complexity, and uh, also really make metabolic networks and decision-making uh, and energy, energy uh, systems that can power uh, complex transformations. And I think that's the core. At some point, if we want to run artificial cells in the future, it's really that we gain a lot of insight and the application is somewhere down the road. And I think we still have a lot to learn and it's much more complicated to build than just to analyze. It's also a lesson I have learned. Okay, what well, I hope I could show you that we basically have this workflow in the lab. Uh, we are working towards different solutions, uh, different things that we call artificial cells. I did not talk about our efforts to also reprogram living systems with our networks, but I think uh, the build a synthetic cell is more about synthetic metabolism than uh, about natural metabolism in, uh, in natural cells. With that, I want to stop here. I want to thank a fantastic team. Um, I did not highlight each individual person. Uh, I mean, I highlighted uh, a couple of people along the way. Let me just tell you, it's a fantastic crowd. Uh, they are really working hard and there's much more going behind the scenes, a lot of non-published stuff, uh, not everything on the web page. Um, and I'm really blessed with so many motivated people. And uh, I, I'm, I really could not have not imagined when I started my lab that I would work together with so many smart people that push everyday science and me also. And sometimes uh, I, I'm really just amazed by the solutions they find in the lab and I can just comment on it. Uh, but I think that's the evolution of a lab. And so evolution of me as a scientist also that the next generation is anyway better than me. So that's it. Thank you so much for your attention, Kate, and uh, everybody else uh, uh, online. And uh, I'm happy to take your questions. And uh, I think I stopped sharing my screen maybe. Thank you so much, Toby. That was fantastic. There are several questions in chat. Um, can you see chat? I can open the chat. It's seven, I think, in total. All yep. right. If you could read the question out loud, uh, that's going to go for the recording. Sure. So the first question is, uh, excellent work. Uh, did anyone try to express the whole catch pathway in vitro? OK, if you really mean in vitro, that is really very, very complicated. As you might imagine, 17 enzymes, a lot of resource competition. Simone managed to express two enzymes uh, that were missing. So that's, I think, the maximum we can currently do. Um, it's too complicated to build the whole system in vitro currently. Uh, um, but it should be a goal at some point for us. And uh, as you have seen, we're already working towards having these positive feedback loops, uh, eventually decision making. So that's one of the things you would need uh, to achieve if you think about replication and perpetuation and, uh, and autocratic cycles. It would be even cooler if you had different setups and actually uh, actually also evolution could use to optimize the cycle, but this is down the road. So in vitro, no, 
the full cycle not individual parts yes okay uh, if you if you just want to comment or leave a comment on me answering the question just type it in again the next question was by uh, paris uh, simmons or simons okay in your catch optimization did you ever try to scaffold the proteins or compartmentalize some parts of the cycle yes that's a very good question um so as you might have guessed correctly we do a lot of chemistry and some stuff is not uh, is not compatible with each other this holds true for enzymes which have similar profiles where you actually have promiscuity or inhibition so you would like to separate those enzymes or you have the formation of a toxic metabolite for instance hydrogen peroxide we had in certain in certain cases of the catch cycle yeah um we did not use scaffolding uh, because that's something we have not really well established in the lab we think of these principles um, in, as a matter of fact, we think of, uh, let's say, selective transport across certain shells or pores to separate things, but it's definitely something that will be required if you really think it through. Scaffolding alone is probably not sufficient because you see you have a directionality if you want to guide a metabolite from an active side to another active side. So just bringing things close together is not something that will work. But what might work is, for instance, having, uh, having as I said, uh, fusion proteins uh, where you have two things facing each other active sites, or you might even have also um, phase separation to some extent. So the things we start to play with, but if there is a great uh, postdoc who wants to pick up some of the things to improve the system, happy to, 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 uh, to talk to this person. All right uh the next question by tracy is where is the catch reaction happening in cells is it engineered plastids or those ends are the cytoplasm thank you for the talk thank you for listening uh so currently uh, we have two different things we have the catch cycle just in vitro uh, or in this synthetic compartment so this is just outside of a cellular context important to note and for us the question really is can we structure it in time and space so that it's very efficient the second part I didn't talk about is it did not talk about is to bring the catch cycle back inside of living organisms, and we actually have started to do that. Uh, this is uh, Alberto in our lab, uh, who actually have brought in and designed selection schemes where we can take part or the whole catch cycle, the sequence, and we can force E. coli to get used to it and use it to make a, a, an essential compound of the cell. And that's ways how we try to implement it into, into a, a living organism, right? And then we hopefully can use uh, evolution to further evolve the pathway and its interplay with the complex metabolic network of the cell. And it's not that easy, right? So it's very hard to bring these new reactions inside of a system which has a thousand or actually 3,000 other reactions uh, parallel running in E. coli. That's a big challenge. And Alberto is, is really struggling with that, but he has also made quite some progress. All right, uh, this is all very cool, but the big question, the next question is what phenotypic effect do any of these have? For example, is plant growth enhanced, better higher temperature, more production of fruits, seeds, original quality? Thanks. Yes, before we can answer this question, we need to bring it inside of a plant and uh, or inside of a photosynthetic organism. So our, our prediction says the following. You can fix more CO2 in time because you have a much more efficient eutrophication reaction and you need less energy. So from both parts, you should fix more CO2 in a given time with a higher yield. So the space-time yield should be higher. And the yield you can actually predict much better because yield is really dependent on any pH ATP you need. And there should be a, at least an ATP con, uh, consumption factor of, of, of two better. And so that is basically the space we're navigating in. Right now, we don't see effects because the catch cycle is not implemented inside of a living organism completely. But what we have been doing, and I did not talk about this, is we have designed other cycles, shorter cycles, that boost photosynthesis. And for some of these cycles, we've actually seen that they actually provide already a benefit. And this is probably the first, uh, the first part you will see inside of a cellular context. And uh, of course, this gives us hope that a complete switch of photosynthesis to the catch cycle would be something we can achieve in the future, but it would be much more complicated. 
So it's easier to tune photosynthesis to bring in supporting C2 fixing enzymes than completely replacing photosynthesis. This would be a long-term goal. But what I can tell you is that at least for certain phenotypes, you see a better uptake and a longer resistance towards uh, environmental conditions because you can operate at lower C2 concentrations. Okay. Then Ravi asks, how far is electrofermentation of amino acids and other molecules? What could be the challenges? Can we do it completely cell-free? Wow, that's uh, it's really cool. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's always a proof of principle. And uh, what's really the challenge is for us is to define and build a technical system you can interface with a biological system. And I think there's two languages we need to speak, right? We actually have to, uh, to understand uh, uh, the coding, the polymers, the transfer of electrons, uh, and we have to understand how to immobilize enzymes. And we also have to understand how to make enzymes more robust. And everything costs money, right? So building, building the uh, let's say uh, the ATP generating system is nice, but it only works in a small scale. And I think the matter, the challenge for us is scalability. So how much does it cost to make a protein that's robust? How robust and how long would the protein operate with uh, with an honor electrode? And then there is of course an economic consideration you have to take into account. At which point? Uh, and how long do you have to operate such a system that it becomes economically viable? I think there is um, there is a, a chance that certain systems will be viable, and the more expensive the product is, the easier it is. Um, what, where I see currently the advantage of of let's say cell-free biology is more like on the prototyping scheme. And I want to give an example with the catch cycle. Let's assume we had built the catch cycle in our heads and we had found the enzymes, then take the complete catch cycle and throw it inside of an organism would have probably not worked. But learning how the network works in vitro and which parts you need to add in certain stoichiometric amounts allowed us to make some predictions how this would be, what would be required if you want to implement it inside of a living organism. So we learn already about the robustness of the system, about the different stoichiometries of the enzymes, and if the cycle works at all. And I think this gives us some elements of implementation. If you look at the latest work, for instance, of the, of the Jewett lab, for that matter, where they prototyped in vitro certain pathways that they then do use to implement in vivo, that's currently state of the art. Uh, it will take some time to provide scalable systems that we can use. And scalability always depends also, of course, on cofactor regeneration. NTPH, I'm very confident you can achieve this to some extent, um, but ATP will be more problematic. And I think these are the challenges, scalability and cofactor regeneration, which make it a bit, a bit harder to deal with. Okay, uh, then we have Radhakrishnan. Uh, Yes. Have you looked into engineering small molecule regulations that are common natural cycles, such as TCA into the catch cycle, stabilize it potentially in vivo applications? Well, that is fantastic. Um, question again, can you actually use feedback systems, allosteric control uh, to make the system more robust against perturbations? It's pretty hard to design such uh, such uh, such uh, allosteric control into enzymes, and it's actually one of the shortcomings um, of uh, of bioengineering. Um, we probably have already some stuff. We know that CoA, for instance, too much free CoA inhibits uh, certain reactions, right? We have such complex allosteric interactions. The point is that for many of the enzymes we use we actually have insufficient understanding in terms of allosteric control because the people that describe these enzymes typically don't screen against thousand other metabolites. And so we're a little bit blind of what we have been using. But I agree it would be important to have such systems where you can exert allosteric control. I'll give you one example. If you, for instance, have a toxic metabolite or the metabolite decays very quickly, it would be fantastic if this metabolite could, could basically repress its own production and you could keep the concentration at a low concentration, it's always consumed to basically build an artificial bottleneck. And so I could think of these systems being really cool and uh, and also tuning in such allosteric control, but I think we cannot do it currently with engineering principles. I think our protein engineering capabilities are still uh, in, insufficient to achieve this level of control, but it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic idea. All right. And then there's a the last question by Asim, who has, have it been thought what the effect of these cells on the nature will be as in hypothetical situation? 
if these cells are someday able to be incorporated in the plants, what do you think would be the effect on animal or insects consuming these plants? Okay, I came across something similar with carbon capture by increasing the amount of methylation plants. Do you have any comments on this? Yes, I have some comments on this. All right, uh, again, very good from the consumer point of view and ecological point of view. And I would answer it in two different ways. Um, so one way is what actually happens if you build a plant that fixes more CO2 more efficiently. And I would argue uh, that such a plant would be a specialist. It would grow probably fast. You still need to put the carbon somewhere into the roots or into the fruits, but you probably would would force the cell to become very good at one trait, which is fixing CO2, but maybe not so good at actually at actually um, being uh, being competitive in the environment. And you see this, for instance, for elite crops. So elite crops are stripped down in a lot of traits, for instance, in, um, in, in against insects, the bitter, the bitter uh, chemicals have been removed so we can eat them. You know, they have been stripped down also in terms of ecological warfare. They need a maintained agricultural field. And in fact, natural plants very often invade the field. So it's like racing horses that can do one thing good, fixing CO2, but they're not competitive in the environment. And I would imagine that a system like we build here would also have this inherent problem. They would be probably very good in fixing CO2, but not very good in, uh, in ecological competition. And this seems to be a common principle in biology that you you'd have these different traits you deal with. So I would not assume that a crop would behave differently than uh, another uh, another crop you have on this planet because you know you still need to fertilize it, you still need to have a managed field, so you have a semi-control about it. Now, if you talk about the metabolites, um, you're absolutely right. We have to think of this is new metabolites uh, that are there, for instance, 3-hydroxypropionate, 4-hydroxybutyrate, which are interesting chemicals. And the question would be, uh, is this toxic or not toxic? Um, and we have thought about certain cycles where we have more orthogonal or more natural, natural pathways that are operating. And again, for some of these cycles, we really have to test the effects uh, in terms of nutrition. Uh, that would be something uh, that I could uh, I could imagine. But then again, that's something we have to test once we have the plants. And for sure, it's in our design that we want to probably have a product at the end of the day that is actually um, is actually viable. All right. Okay. Wouldn't it be better to modify plants that are used for timber for these modifications? Yes, you don't need to think about food. You can think about different ways. As, as long as you make biomass, for instance, uh, you can think about biochar, you can think about deposition. Uh, so if you think about global scales, uh, we probably have a capacity of storing another 300 gigatons carbon in the soils, which we've depleted over the last 200 years. And that's actually exactly what is too much in the atmosphere. And so in principle, the soil is depleted again of carbon. Uh, because we actually have done a lot of deforestation, we have uh, used land agricultural setup, uh, we have built cities. Uh, so in, in principle, there is an opportunity to store long-term carbon and you don't need to eat the food in the super plants if you had super plants. You can actually basically uh, uh, convert the carbon into a long store unit. This could be wood, this could be also biochar processing down, downstream and uh, even construction industry would be very interested in having uh, certain plant-based materials to increase stiffness of concrete or actually uh, to use and store carbon uh, instead of uh, using cement. So these are currently thoughts which are actively pursued. All right, these were all the questions online. Uh, I hope I went through it. Thank yes. you. Anything, good. Yes, yes, you did. Thank you so much for answering all of them. Um, my question was going to be similar to someone to what someone already asked about in vitro. So thank you for answering that. Um, if there are no more questions, I want to say thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Toby, uh, for a fantastic talk. Thanks, everyone else. And see you not next week. We actually have a break. So see you all in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thank you so much for having me here. And yeah, enjoy your day or your night, whatever your which time. <laughs> Okay. Good night to you in Germany. Bye. Bye.